A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter 12 from our Genetics Essentials Concepts and Genetics 4th Edition textbook. This chapter covers control of gene expression. Remember what gene expression means. It's the process of a gene being transcribed and translated into a protein. Remember the central dogma of molecular biology, that genes are expressed as proteins. So if you're going to control gene expression, that means that you, the cell needs to be able to regulate gene expression. Why would you want to regulate gene expression? Well, there are many reasons to regulate gene expression, whether you are a single cell organism or a multicellular organism, a prokaryote or a eukaryote. All living uh, creatures need to regulate gene expressions. Let's start with the easy one. Let's start with you and me, right? Human beings. Our cells, our nucleated cells in our body contain our entire genome, right? Every nucleated cell in your body contains the 46 chromosomes. You know, your entire genome for the most part, right? So what's then... Uh, the use of a skin cell producing insulin for, per se. You know you have an insulin gene, right? Don't you have an insulin gene? And you know what, what uh, insulin's good for? Insulin's good for regulating your blood sugar, right? Do you think your skin cells produce insulin? Do you think your skin cells uh, do gene expression of the insulin gene? Uh, if you were to take some skin cells and be able to assess what's going on inside that skin cell, do you think you would find a bunch of insulin floating around that skin cell, inside of that skin cell, or being secreted out of that skin cell? No, of course not. It's your pancreas. It's those islet cells of the pancreas that produce those uh, insulin, right? The, the insulin molecule. And then they secrete the, the pancreas secretes that insulin into the bloodstream where it goes about the bloodstream to regulate blood sugar, right? So think about it. You only want your, your, your specialized cells inside of your pancreas to produce insulin. It, it, it wouldn't make sense for any other cells in your body to do that. So don't you have to control gene expression to where... Uh, uh, one of your cells from the pancreas knows it needs to express the insulin gene. Whereas on your skin cell, your skin cell has no business expressing that gene. It has its own genes. It has its own skin cell genes that it needs to uh, express. Does that make sense? Uh, collagen, for instance, your skin cells will make collagen protein because collagen is very important for a skin cell. So, what you need to understand is all of your nucleated cells have all of your genome, all of the chromosomes. The difference between a skin cell and a pancreas cell and a liver cell and a heart cell and a brain cell is the subset of genes that are being expressed, right? So the reason a skin cell is a skin cell is because of the genes that are being expressed. That's what makes it a skin cell. Otherwise, genetically, it's identical to your pancreas cell. Does that make sense? You know, uh, it's like, it's like uh, I have this analogy, right? You could have a whole library on cooking, right? But if you're a baker and, you know, you have a bakery, you don't need the, the books on how to make steak or lamb chops or sushi or pasta, right? You don't need those books in the library. You just need the chapters on uh, on how to how to bake and, and cookies and cakes and so, so forth, pastries and such. Does that make sense? If I'm a pastry chef, I just need to know the recipes 
for the pastries. I don't need to know the recipes for lamb chops. I'm not a lamb chop shop. <laughs> I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not a fancy restaurant with, with fancy lamb chops. I'm a, a bakery with cake, right? So think about it. Think about your body that way. Just because you have all the information, the cells have all the information, doesn't mean you need to express all the information. You know, uh, a skin cell can shut off all the genes it doesn't have any business reading because you know because it doesn't need all those proteins and just focus on the on the genes that it needs to be a skin cell okay um and that's why gene regulation is so important and that's why this chapter is so important and even a single cell organism like an e coli right e coli you're like well why would an e coli need gene expression or gene regulation of expression well uh not because it has to specialize into a skin cell or a pancreas cell, obviously, because it's a single cell creature, but because it doesn't want to express all of its genes, you know, uh, all the time because it may not need all of those gene products all the time. So I'm going to introduce a concept later in this chapter covering the lac operon. Where, if you're wondering what that is right now, it'll be clear when we get there, but we're going to cover the lac operon. And what that is, it's a mechanism that the E. coli has, you know, and other bacterium have in order to sense when there's lactose around and that turns on the genes that are required for breakdown and metabolism of lactose. Does that make sense? Why, why express a bunch of genes and make a bunch of proteins and expend all that energy to make, for instance, the enzyme that breaks down lactose, if there's no lactose around, you know how much uh, energy that the cell has and resources the cell has to put into making that enzyme just for there not to be any lactose around to break down? It's a waste of resources. So what you can do, even as a single cell organism, is turn off the genes where you don't need the gene products, you don't need those enzymes because they're not useful at the moment, and then turn them on if you do need them, and uh, you know when in only the circumstances when you do need them. So gene regulation is important, regular whether you're talking about prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Now it happens a little bit differently in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and that's what we're going to jump into here. So let's look at the concepts of this chapter. We're looking at genes and regulatory elements. We're looking at levels of gene regulation, DNA binding proteins. Okay, and here's some terminology that you need to know uh, whether you're talking about a eukaryote or a prokaryote, and that is uh, structural genes. What does that mean? These are these are these are the genes that encode the proteins that go on to do functions in the cell. So when I say structural gene, I mean a gene like insulin, uh, a gene that goes on to uh, metabolize something in the cell or build something or break down like all the or the enzymes of the cell you know a, a useful protein uh, hi wicket wicket's here say hi um, he's, he's looking at the monitor actually right here hi wicket um, uh, so again a structural gene is a typical gene that codes for a protein a useful protein in the cell a regulatory gene, on the other hand, this uh, codes for products that affect transcription, right? So it could be a, uh, a regulatory gene could code for a protein that regulates transcription, or it could code for an RNA that regulates transcription. Okay, so a regulatory gene helps to control gene expression, right? It, it's, it's product controls gene expression, whereas a structural gene, it doesn't have effect on gene expression. It has an effect somewhere else in the cell. That's either an enzyme or, a, or some other uh, molecule, that a signaling molecule or a receptor or something else in the cell. And when I say regulatory elements, these are segments or sequences of DNA that are not transcribed at all, but play a role in uh, gene expression. For instance, when I say an enhancer or a, or a operator or a promoter, those would be regulatory elements. Here's some more terminology for you. A constitutive 
constitutively active gene or a, or a constitutive expression, when you hear that term, that means a constantly or continuously expressed uh, gene. Uh, so if you could say a gene is constitutively active, that means that that gene is always on. If you have a gene under positive control, that you have to stimulate gene expression. If you have a gene under negative control, you inhibit gene expression. So what is a constitutive gene? Always on, uh, expressed continually. Now, like I said before, you've, you have to regulate gene expression, right? You, you got to tell uh, the, the cell, or the cell tells the genome what is going to be expressed, what genes are going to be expressed, and when, right? And there's multiple different levels of regulation that can take place. You could, uh, you could, you could uh, change the structure of the DNA uh, in order to give access to the promoter, right? Give give transcription factors access to the promoter. You could sequester the DNA. Do you remember the whole concept of histone proteins? I told you DNA wraps around histone proteins. Did you remember that? Well, you could. So imagine you have um, two histone proteins like this. Imagine if you modify those histone tails and the histone proteins, those nucleosomes, kind of sequester. They come together. Do you think that would make it easier or harder for the gene to be read and the gene to be expressed? If, the, if all the uh, histone proteins and all the nucleosomes uh, were modified in such a way that they kind of bundled up like this, do you think that would make it easier or harder to do gene expression? Harder, right? Because you could modify the histone tails to sequester things like promoters so that promoters are no longer accessible to the, um, the transcription machinery. Does that make sense? Uh, remember RNA polymerase? RNA polymerase won't be able to attach if the promoter's sequestered. Conversely, you could modify the tails to make the histones really spread out. And that would make the DNA relaxed, making the promoters much more accessible for transcription. Does that make sense? So isn't that one level of, of, of um, control on gene expression? If you alter the structure of the chromosome, if you cause the histone tails to com uh, compact, turn off gene expression, relax, turn on gene expression, and then the level of transcription, right? Uh, you can also control transcription. How can you control transcription? Well, you could have proteins that are repressors, for instance, like a protein that goes here and prevents transcription because it, it binds to the promoter and it prevents transcription. You could have control at the level of mRNA processing. You could prevent mRNA processing. Remember. Five prime poly, uh, five prime cap, three prime poly A tail, uh, splicing. You could you could interfere with that process, and then you're not gonna get a uh, mature mRNA, are you? You could interfere with the RNA stability. You know, remember the RNA is a highly reactive molecule; it breaks down easily. Well, you could affect that, right? If you affect the stability of the mRNA the mRNA will degrade and go away. And that's one way to control gene expression. You could affect translation, right? You could mess with the uh, ribosome, for instance. What if you messed with the ribosome? Wouldn't that slow down gene expression? Some proteins, when they're made, they're inactive until they're post-translationally modified. That means when the protein is finished, it's not an active protein, but then it needs to be cleaved or modified with sugars or something needs to happen for that protein to become active. And that's called a post-translational modification. What if you hindered post-translational modifications? Or what if you modified the protein itself in such a way that it became inactive? That's what drugs do, right? That's how drugs function. So you see how all of these are levels by which you could affect gene expression. However, what would be the best? What's What would you recommend uh, the cell to do? What's the most energy efficient way of regulating gene expression, do you think? Which one of these levels here that you see 
which one of these levels would be the best for regulating gene expression energy efficiency wise I would say hopefully you were saying these two at least right uh, at the level of transcription or structure right does that make sense why put a lot of energy into even transcribing anything if you're just going to block its function later does that make sense it's a lot more energy efficient to prevent transcription in the first place than to allow transcription to happen and say try to mess up translation or rna stability later on right that's less efficient so look at this why is transcription that leads to this question why is transcription a particularly important level of gene regulation out of these levels here that we just talked about? Why is transcription a particularly important level in both bacteria and eukaryotes? Well, just like we just mentioned, transcription is the first step of the process of information transfer from DNA to protein. For cellular efficiency, gene expression is often regulated early in the process of protein production because you're not gonna waste all that time copying the DNA into mRNA if you're a eukaryote, then processing that pre-mRNA into mRNA, and then, you know, that's a lot of work you're going to do if you're just going to not, you know, use the gene product later on. Here's uh, another important term. You may have covered this in Biology 1406. I know I, I covered this in my class. But this is, the, this is the concept of an operon. What you need to know is that prokaryotes possess operon and eukaryotes do not okay what is an operon i'm gonna jump to the end here and i'm gonna tell it this way first essentially what is an operon it's multiple genes under the control of a single promoter so and usually it's not just multiple genes it's multiple functionally related genes okay usually down one metabolic a particular metabolic pathway uh, for instance, we're going to talk about the LAC operon. Um, we're going to talk about the LAC operon later in this chapter, and that's a perfect example of an operon. That's actually the textbook example of an operon. And what, what you have there is one promoter, one promoter in front of three genes. All of those genes appear to play a role in lactose breakdown and metabolism. Does that make sense? So... Uh, because there's only one promoter, when the RNA polymerase copies all that information, it will, it will make one super long mRNA, including the, the mRNA information for gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3 in one really long mRNA. Does that make sense? Because there's one promoter and three genes, in the case of lac operon, you're going to end up copying three genes worth of information in one really, really long mRNA. Um, so that's what a operon is. So, and here's another way of putting it, a promoter plus additional sequences that control transcription, including an operator, plus two or more structural genes, okay? And what's a regulator gene? A regulator gene is DNA sequence encoding products that affect the operator function, but are not part of the operon. So if you're confused right here, don't worry. I'm going to get into what a regulator gene is, what a what an operator is. We're going to get into that. It's all part of the operon. We're going to start talking about operons, and, and these terms will become more clear. So concept check number three time. What is the difference between a structural gene and a regulator gene? And I'm not going to read through all of these, but I want to jump to the answer here. A structural gene encodes proteins. Remember, Proteins such as enzymes or receptors or some kind of me metabol, uh, some some kind of protein involved in metabolism, something like that, or a structural protein, some kind of useful protein for the cell. But a regulator gene controls transcription, right, of the structural genes. So, it, a, you would call a regulator gene any gene that gives rise to a product that regulates gene expression. Usually these products are proteins, but sometimes they could be RNA. Okay, so it's D. So here is an example of an operon. Okay, here's an example of an operon. Uh, here, this is the operon here at the top right. You can see that there's the promoter. The promoter is where the RNA polymerase, remember RNA polymerase, 
uh, enzyme will bind to the promoter to to promote gene expression of remember this is an operon so you're gonna have multiple genes gene a gene b gene c right and the operator is the stretch of dna kind of overlapping but in between the promoter and gene a it kind of overlaps the promoter overlaps gene a so so that's what the operator is the operator is found between the promoter and gene a and do you remember what a definition of the operator is um a sequence that controls transcription as the operator. So the operator is going to play a role in the regulation of this of this gene, of this uh, actually of this operon. And what's this over here on the left? This is a promoter with a regulator gene. This is a regulator, right? A regulator, not a structural gene, a regulator gene. So here's how this is working. Let me show you an example of an operator. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, an example of an operon and its function. So here, let's let's go ahead and, and break it down. Number one, an operon is a group of structural genes, in this case, gene A, gene B, and gene C, plus sequences that control transcription, like the promoter. The promoter controls transcription because it recruits RNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase wants to transcribe, but it also includes another sequence that controls transcription called the operator and the operator can you know be bound by things like repressors or regulator proteins right regulator proteins we're going to talk about that in a second number two a separate regulator gene remember i said this is a different gene a regulator gene with its own promoter encodes a regulator protein so uh, here's your regulator gene transcribe translate into a regulator protein either a uh, uh, like a repressor or an inducer, does that make sense? Um, or an activator, I'm sorry, a repressor or an activator. This could be a repressor if it's going to stop transcription uh, or gene expression. This could be an activator if it's going to promote, promote activation or promote gene expression. And this regulator protein goes where? Binds to the operator that may bind to the operator site to regulate the transcription of mRNA. Now, once this is transcribed, remember the RNA polymerase transcribes this operon. Remember I said you end up with one really long mRNA with gene information for gene A, gene B, and gene C. Three different gene information on one really long mRNA and that's translated into protein A, protein B, protein C which usually plays a role in some biochemical pathway. So protein A might convert precursor X to an intermediate product. Protein B will convert that square product into a triangular product. And protein C may then make the final product Y. Does that make sense? Notice how uh, proteins A, B, and C, because they were part of the same operon, uh, they're functionally related. They're usually part of the same metabolic pathway. Isn't that interesting? So there's a good example of an operon. And there's different kinds of operons. There are operons that are uh, regulated by repressors. There are operons that are regulated by activators. There are all kinds of different ways to turn on an operon. There are, there are operators that are normally on, but then you can turn them off. There are operons that are normally off, and then you can turn them on. You know, so uh, we're going to get into that next. Okay, so negative and positive control, inducible and repressible operons, right? So when you're talking about operon, there are four important terms associated with the operon, right? Uh, remember, I just gave you all those examples. It's normally off, but then you could turn it on, or it's normally on, but you could turn it off, right? So let's look into these important terms for the operon. Uh, a negative control when you're talking about an operon or a, or a gene expression, negative control is when you have a repressor, right? Something, a, the regulatory protein is a repressor, which represses or stops transcription, right? In positive control, that's the converse. You have an activator. That means something that turns on gene expression, turns on transcription. Now, here's, so you're like, okay, so, in negative control, you're dealing with a repressor. In positive control, you're dealing with an activator. Uh, now, here's two more terms you need to know. Inducible operons are normally off, 
but you can turn them on by doing something or adding something. Does that make sense? Repressible operons are normally on, but you can turn them off by doing something or adding something. So just remember that, okay? If you could keep those terms straight, it'll make sense of this whole chapter or a big chunk of this chapter. If you get these terms messed up, then, you know, it makes looking at these a nightmare because they are kind of confusing. So that's why I'm, I'm going to cut and paste for you this, the, this key, this legend here uh, over and over until you drill it in your head what negative control, positive control, inducible, repressible means so that you can best understand how these operon work. So again, uh, inducible operon, we already touched on these, so I'm going to just show you instead of read through all this because it just it'll just confuse you. I'm just going to go to the example after we do a concept check number four. So concept check number four in a negative repressible operon. Oh, gosh. OK, let's stop and think. What does negative control mean? Let's go back to our cheat sheet, right? Go back to your cheat sheet. Negative control. You're dealing with a repressor. Negative control. You're dealing with a repressor. And what was it? Uh, negative repressible normally on so it's a gene that's normally on uh, and it deals with a repressor right so normally on oh it uh, deals with a repressor normally on right does that make sense so is synthesis the protein is synthesized as an inactive repressor right that makes sense you have a repressor that's attached to um, that, that does not attach to the promoter. This will become clear when I explain it in the next slide, but um, remember I said you need to do something in order to get the repressor to work, in order to, uh, okay, let, let, me, let me just show you an example because it's, it's a lot sh easier to show you than to explain it just without a, a graphical representation. So look, what was this an example of a negative repressible operon? So let's look at this. Here's a negative repressible operon. Let's kind of zoom in here a little bit. Here we go. Negative repressible operon. Okay. Remember, negative means we're dealing with a repressor. Okay. Repressible means it's normally on. So here's your regulatory gene making a repressor. Here's your repressor. Here's your operon with the promoter and the operator, right? And do you remember it's normally on, right? It's normally on. You see this, this uh, operon is normally on. What does that tell you about its repressor? Do you think the repressor is normally on as well? Like the, the repressor is normally stuck here on a gene that's normally on? Think about that for a minute. If the gene is normally on, would its repressor be normally stuck here and normally on the DNA? No, because if a repressor, if a repressor was here on the DNA, the gene would not be on. Does that make sense? You need to do something in order to turn off these genes. So in this case, there is a product of some sort. This product, see this diamond? This product needs to do something it needs to attach to your receptor to change the conformation of the receptor to an active receptor the receptor then can uh, bind to the operator and block gene expression does that make sense did you guys follow me so by remembering that negative control means a repressor you're dealing with a repressor and remembering that repressible operons are normally on you were able to deduce what's going on here with this type of regulation. I have, I'm dealing with a repressor, but my gene is normally on. That means my repressor is not normally functioning until I do something to it, right? Until uh, I have a product and this product is able to attach to and bind to my repressor, making it active such that it now changes conformation. It can now bind to the operator and turn off my gene expression. Did you guys see that? You see what I'm saying? So, so by understanding that now, does this make more sense in a negative repressible operon? 
the regulator protein is synthesized as an inactive repressor. An inactive repressor. See, this is an inactive repressor. Because, why? Because my gene is normally on. If a repressor was active, my gene wouldn't be normally on. Does that make sense? The inactive repressor needs to be activated by some product, right, some product. So let's look at the other examples here. Let's look at uh, negative inducible, right? Negative inducible. What does negative mean? It's dealing with a repressor. What does inducible mean? Normally off. So you're dealing with a repressor and this is an operon that's normally off. So are you dealing with an active or an in or inactive repressor? Well, if, if the gene is normally off, that means this, this repressor is automatically active. This repressor can bind to the operator with no help, and it normally keeps the polymerase off. It normally keeps the gene off. Does that make sense? But now you do something to it. A product or substrate or something binds to this uh, repressor, inactivating the repressor. The repressor can no longer bind to the operator, permitting transcription to continue. Did you see how that worked? All right, let's look at a positive inducible event. Positive, po what does positive mean? You're dealing with an activator. An activator is the opposite of a repressor. An activator helps transcription to happen, right? And without the activator, it's difficult for transcription to happen, right? So here it's positive, so you're dealing with an activator and it's inducible, which means it's normally off. The gene is normally off. Now look at this. If this green thing is an activator, something that turns on the gene, but the gene is normally off, do you think this activator is an active or an inactive activator? Inactive, because you know 90% of the time or whatever, it's not actually doing its job because it's an inactive activator. It needs to bind to a special substrate change confirmation, bind to the operator. Actually, it doesn't bind exactly to the operator. It actually usually binds a little bit upstream of the of the promoter and operator. Activators do, by the way. Activators usually bind up here. Because think about it, if an activator bind, bound down here, it would actually be in the way of the promoter. So activators usually bind upstream of the promoter, uh, FYI. Uh, so, so now the gene is on, right? So again, positive means you're dealing with an activator. Inducible means the gene is normally off. Why would a gene normally be off? Well, because my activator must not be functioning until it gets a special substrate bound uh, in a certain condition, and then it turns on and does its job, right? It, it allows the gene to turn on. And the last example here is a positive repressible. So what does this mean? Positive means you're dealing with an activator, and repressible means the gene is normally on. So look here, the operator is normally functioning. So what does that tell you about your activator? Well, that means that your activator is, is functioning all the time too. It's an active activator. So if, the, if there's a product of some sort, the, a product that can interact with that activator, that could inactivate the activator, blocking transcription. Did you see that? So these are four mechanisms that you need to know about, four mechanisms by which genes are regulated by uh, repressors, activators, you know, and whether or not they're inducible or repressible. And this happens in bacteria. This is the gene regulation in bacteria functions in this fashion, right? gene regulation in bacteria. This is how it works. This is how genes are regulated in your E. coli friend, right? And this is just uh, going into each one of those examples that we just touched on. So now let's talk a little bit about the most famous of the, uh, and well studied, and well studied of the operon, the LAC operon, no, uh, short for lactose, right? The LAC operon of E. coli. This is a negative, it involves a repressor, inducible, it's normally off, operon. It's involved in lactose metabolism. You know it's genes A, B, and C? 
those genes make products that play a role in lactose metabolism. So the E. coli can metabolize lactose if lactose is in the environment. You know, that makes sense. It's normally off. It's an inducible operon, right? It's normally off. Because think about it. Does E. coli always have access to lactose? Does it always have access to milk or dairy? Not always. You know, lac uh, E. coli lives in your intestinal system, right? Are you constantly drinking milk and cheese? Well, some of you might, you know. I like myself some milk and cheese too. But, um, you know, if you're not eating a ton of milk and cheese, there's no real reason for the E. coli in your gut to continuously make, uh, you know, the enzymes that break down lactose. Does that make sense? So this is a mechanism by which uh, E. coli can sense he has little feelers, can sense for lactose. If it encounters some lactose, it quickly transcribes those three genes it needs in order to quickly digest the lactose and makes the most out of that lactose. But if there's no lactose around, it's normally off, right? It, it, it has an ability to turn off those genes and not digest the lactose. Does that make sense? So here the, indu the inducer is allolactose. What is an inducer? Um, real quick. Uh, you know how I said there are these uh, these little molecules that bind to the to the activator or to the repressor? That's an inducer. That's this is what I mean by inducer. It's the small molecule that binds to the repressor or you know the activator to do it to do the job to turn on the gene to turn on the gene. Inducers turn on genes. Okay, so in this case, allolactase. Uh, Allolactose is the um, allolactose is the inducer, and you're dealing with a repressor coding gene. This is your regulatory gene, lac I. You're dealing with an operon promoter, which lac P is the promoter of the operon, and lac O is the operator, uh, operator of the operon. And then you have your genes A, B, and C, right? Remember your structural genes A, B, and C. Those genes are lac Z which encodes beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose to glucose and galactose. So remember, lactose is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose. Well, uh, beta-galactosidase breaks the glycosidic bond between the glucose and the galactose. It separates the monosaccharides from one another, right? It also, this is important, it also converts some of the lactose into allolactose, kind of a uh, isomer of lactose, if you will. And then you have LACY, which encodes a permease. Permease is an active transporter that gets lactose into the cell. So it's like a lactose importer protein. And then you have LACA, which the function is not totally clear, but they're pretty sure it has something to do with the toxicity events going on during lactose fermentation or lactose digestion uh, or something like that. They don't know exactly for sure the function of lac A, but they assume it has to do with lactose digestion. Uh, then there's the repression. Oh, by the way, this is a good thing to note. The repression of the lac operon is never completely, uh, you know, full. Like they never, it's never totally off. You can never turn the lac operon totally off because you always need some basal amount of this uh, beta galactosidase floating around so that you can have the inducer allolactose around. Does that make sense? So here is uh, a cell membrane. You've got your cell membrane, the E. coli cell membrane. Remember permease, which was lac Y? Permease codes for the permease uh, active transporter which actively transports the disaccharide lactose into the cell. Lactose is then digested. Its, its glycosidic bond here is broken by the enzyme beta-galactosidase. Um, and that breaks the, the lactose into glucose and uh, galactose monosaccharides, which are then used for energy in the cell. And remember, beta-galactosidase also manipulates lactose in such a way that you end up with allolactose, an isomer of, of uh, lactose. And remember, what does allolactose go on to do? It goes on to 
it as an inducer. It goes on to induce the lac operon. So I'm going to show you how that happens in a minute. What is the fate of allolactose? What does it do? Right. So concept check number five time. In the presence of allolactose, the lac repressor does what? Does the lac repressor, the repressor, does it bind to the operator? No, remember this, the repressor is uh, always on the DNA because this gene's always off, right? Or normally off. Binds to the promoter, cannot bind to the operator, binds to the regulator gene. I think it's cannot bind, right? If allolactose is around, allolactose will bind to the repressor, inactivating the repressor, allowing transcription of lac Z, lac Y, lac A. So it's C, cannot bind to the operator. So let me show you that process here, look. Here's if there's no lactose around. The lac operon with the absence of lactose. Here's your regulator, uh, regulator gene, lac I. So you have the promoter for lac I, and then you have uh, the gene for lac I, which transcribes and translates into an active regulator protein, which is a repressor, right? Because this is a this is a gene that's normally off. This is an active repressor. It will bind to the operator, lac O, right? The operator of the lac operon. This prevents the RNA polymerase from attaching and doing its job. See. RNA polymerase can't attach. And the lac Z, lac Y, lac A genes are not expressed, right? No transcription is occurring. Now, what if there's lactose around? Here's the presence of lactose. Remember the presence of lactose? Beta galactosidase uh, isomerizes lactose to allolactose. Allolactose then binds as a regulator uh, molecule, right? It's an inducer. It binds to the repressor, the repressor, inactivating the repressor. Now the repressor can no longer bind to the operator and RNA polymerase is more than happy to bind and transcribe these genes. Why? Because you want beta-galactosidase to form, you want permease, you want trans acetate, Transacetylase, I always get tongue twisted on this one, transacetylase to form as well. You want these three gene products to form because you want them to assist in breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose and for further production of allolactose so you can continue allowing gene expression to happen. Then imagine, imagine after a while the lactose is gone well, then the levels of allolactose will drop and the, you know, the, the, the adherence of, of allolactose to the repressor, you know, the, they will uh, lose bonding. The repressor will become activated again and bind to the repressor, turning off those genes. So in the absence of lactose, the repressor is not bound to allolactose. It represses gene expression in the presence of lactose. Allolactose is formed by beta-galactosidase and gene expression is turned on because the repressor is inactivated. Do you see how that works? Awesome. Again, here is a close look at the lac operon uh, promoter and operator. Here is the promoter of the lac operon. Here is the operator of, uh, actually, hold on. The operator is right here. The operator is right here and the operator overlaps with part of the promoter and part of the first gene here, the lac Z gene. You see that? So the operator, think about it, if the lac repressor is bound here, well then the RNA polymerase is not going to bind to its, you know, consensus, minus 10 consensus sequencers, minus 35 consensus sequence. The, the RNA polymerase is not going to be able to bind if there's something right in its way, you see. But, but when allolactose comes along and binds to the lac repressor, the lac repressor can release from the DNA, allowing RNA polymerase to attach and to uh, proceed with gene transcription and gene expression of those genes, the, the lac genes. All right, so before we move on to this part, uh, where we're talking more about eukaryotes now and how gene expression works in eukaryotic uh, cells, 
Uh, let's take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll be coming back strong to finish this chapter. What do you say? Hey everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's keep going with this chapter, finish it strong. What do you say? So where we left off, we were talking about gene expression in prokaryotes mainly, and now we're going to pick up talking about eukaryotes. How is, genes, uh, how, how is gene expression conducted in a eukaryote? Again, you have structural genes, and what you need to know is that you don't have operon in a eukaryote. Each gene has its own promoter, so you're not going to get these super long mRNA with multiple gene information on them you're going to end up with one promoter per gene. So you only get one uh, pro pro protein product per gene, right? Uh, histones play a role in eukaryotes. Remember histones, uh, the DNA wraps around the histone proteins and you can modify the tails of the histone proteins in order to allow uh, transcription to proceed or to sequester the promoters and prevent transcription from proceeding. Remember that in eukaryotes, transcription and translation do not happen at the same time in the same place. They happen at different times at different places. Uh, so transcription and RNA processing occur in the nucleus first and then the mature mRNA is exported to the cytoplasm where translation is conducted to form the protein. Now, at the first level of, uh, of uh, regulation, you have histone modification. Remember, you can, you can alter the chromatin structure. You, these histone tails can be modified, post-translationally modified. If you add methyl groups to the histone tails, this causes chromatin to uh, clump up. The, the chromatin tails move together, sequestering promoters and preventing uh, you know, uh, RNA polymerase or other transcription factors from getting in there and turning on gene expression. Conversely, by adding acetyl groups, for instance, acetylating the, the histone tails, this causes the chromatin to relax, exposing that promoter to the RNA polymerase and the transcription factors and all these other factors that can turn on gene expression. So you can see here, this is a graphical representation um, or, or illustration. This is an illustration of what I was talking about. You have a uh, chromatin strand here with uh, nucleosomes. Here's a nucleosome, nucleosome. You've got individual nucleosomes. These are the histone octamers. And these little swiggles, uh, these swiggles depict the histone tails, right? You can modify the little histone tails. If you add acetyl groups to the tails, the, the DNA, the chromatin, relaxes. It disrupts the chromatin structure, allowing transcription to take place because you're you're revealing the promoters and all the other transcription binding sites, right? Conversely, if you were to methylate, if you would add methyl groups to these tails, that would cause them to sequester the DNA and kind of clump up and condense, and that would prevent gene expression. Here's some terminology we need to know. Uh, in eukaryotic cells, you have what's known as the as basal transcription apparatus which is composed of just general transcription factors and RNA polymerase. The basal transcription apparatus is capable of transcribing genes, but at minimal levels, very low levels. In order to get good activation of these genes and proper expression of the genes, you're going to need additional transcriptional uh, regulators. These are like your transcription factors, right? Your transcriptional regulators increase the basal transcription of the basal transcription apparatus. They increase the basal transcription to levels of normal cells. And they can also interact with enhancers. And we'll talk about enhancers in just a minute. So here is a promoter of a eukaryotic gene. There's your Tata box. 
you know, where the promoter can, can recognize the, you know, uh, or the RNA polymerase can recognize the promoter. You also have enhancers. Enhancers are regulatory elements that can be located some distance from a gene. So look, here down, uh, upstream, upstream of, the, of the promoter, you can have a stretch of DNA called the enhancer, which recruits uh, these uh, transcriptional activator proteins, these enhancer proteins, and these proteins can cause the DNA to loop back and interact with different mediators, different uh, uh, transcription factors that will allow transcription to proceed. So you've got, you see this, this here, this here is your basal transcription apparatus, which allows transcription to occur by, but by, to some very minimal extent. But with the help of these other uh, transcriptional regulator proteins, remember like this, like this, and mediators and co-activators sometimes, you get more robust activation of the gene expression. Does that make sense? Again, this is the basal transcription apparatus, which co consists of various transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that help with uh, gene expression. Um, you got transcription factors, you've got your RNA polymerase. This makes up your basal transcription apparatus for low level gene expression. But with the help of transcriptional regulator proteins, these transcriptional activators, and sometimes the assistance of a co-activator or a mediator, you can have more robust activation of the gene. Okay. So concept check number seven. Most transcriptional activator proteins affect transcription by interacting with what? what? What did the transcriptional regulator proteins interact with to improve gene expression? Did they interact with the introns? No. Did they interact with the basal transcription apparatus? Yes, to, to, to amp it up. It's like putting a turbo booster or a turbo or a supercharger on your car, right? It's, it, it, it ramps up the basal transcription apparatus. Okay, not the DNA polymerase, that's the enzyme that copies DNA into DNA, not the nucleosomes, it's B, the basal transcription apparatus. Now, here's an interesting thing. Again, uh, in eukaryotes, you have your Tata -ta box, right? Uh, that's a recognition sequence for your uh, RNA polymerase. However, you have these other recognition sequences as well. These are regulatory sequences or consensus sequences and there's what you need to know you obviously don't have to memorize all this stuff but what you need to know is that there are different sites like this different recognition sequences or elements that bind different types of transcription factors or uh, regulator regulator proteins for each promoter so a different subset like Remember these transcriptional regulator proteins, the co-activators, the mediators, and all these all these uh, elements here. There's a different subset of those that binds to, let's say, this promoter. Then this one may have different subset of of uh, transcription factors. This gene might require a different subset of uh, transcription factors. Does that make sense? So think about it. Again, in my skin cells, I want you know, skin genes, genes that code for my skin uh, proteins to, to be expressed, right? Well, then my skin cells may have different uh, promoter elements that recruit different transcription factors, right, than my heart cells, right? My heart cells may have uh, different types of promoter elements, right? These transcription binding sites. So, a different subset of transcription factors might activate a lot of my heart uh, genes than the subset of transcription factors, let's say, in my skin, right? So that's kind of interesting, you see? So that's another way of regulating gene expression by different tissue types in your body may express different types of these uh, transactivators, different types of these transcriptional regulator proteins. Does that make sense? So, so this transcriptional regulator protein may only be expressed in your heart cells, right? Um, in your skin cells, you may not have this transcriptional activator protein at all. 
interesting stuff. So it's a little bit more complicated than the, the gene expression system in prokaryotes, and as it should be, right? I mean, we are a multicellular, very complex creature that undergoes this complex development um, during embryogenesis, and, and, you know, you need all these different genes to work together in concert, whereas in an E. coli cell, you know, uh, if there's no lactose around, I want to turn off lactose. You know, it's a lot more simple than in, let's say, a human. But in eukaryotes, you also have transcriptional repressors. These bind to elements called silencers. Silencers, just like enhancers, are sites where, uh, 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 you know, there's binding, but binding of repressors to, to inhibit gene expression. Enhancers, remember, these are, again, sequences that stimulate gene uh, expression, gene transcription, uh, even from a distance away by, by binding to those transcription factors. And then insulators. Insulator is kind of interesting. As its name suggests, it's a DNA sequence that blocks or insulates the effect of enhancers. So if you have an insulator here, well, then this enhancer might not be able to affect this gene, right? Does that make sense? So if there is a if there is an insulator between your enhancer and the gene you're trying to regulate, that's going to block the effect of that enhancer. Concept number eight, concept check eight. How does the binding of a regulatory protein or binding of regulatory proteins to enhancers affect transcription at genes that are thousands of base pairs away? How can, essentially it's asking, how can enhancers work if they're so far away from the basal transcription machinery? Well, remember the DNA loops back, right? Remember your enhancer picture here? Even though the enhancer is way over here, the DNA loops back and then your transcriptional activator protein is able to interact with the basal transcription apparatus, sometimes through a mediator or something like that. You see? So uh, the answer is by looping, right? DNA between the enhancer and the promoter loops out. It loops so that the transcription activators bound to the enhancer are able to actually interact with the basal transcription apparatus. Now, we haven't touched much on RNA silencing, so I'll just give you the answer to this. Uh, but in, in, in RNA silencing, remember we touched on this a little bit before. I told you a little bit about RNA silencing with siRNA, miRNA, CRISPR, stuff like that. In RNA silencing, siRNAs and miRNAs, right, short interfering RNAs and microRNAs, uh, usually bind to which part of the mRNA molecules they control, and that is the three prime untranslated region of the mRNA. So take a look here. This is another level of gene expression. You can, uh, you know, a lot of creatures regulate gene expression by utilizing short interfering RNAs or microRNAs. Uh, there is a a, a, a big area of study right now on microRNAs in your body. Did you know your own body has genes that uh, the, the gene product isn't a protein, but it's an mRNA? It's a, so let me show you this. Here's an mRNA. It's a, it's a piece of RNA that loops back to form double-stranded RNA. It's, it's actually a single-strand RNA, but because it loops back and complements itself, it kind of forms this artificial double-stranded RNA, and then this enzyme dicer goes in and dices up, it, it degrades the, the double-strand RNA into microRNAs, and the microRNA associates with the risk complex, and that comes and inhibits translation of, of mRNAs, of, of transcripts in the cell that have a similar sequence, right? So that inhibits translation. Did you see what happened? Uh, you had a gene with a code on it, and that gene product, that mRNA, was able to flop around, uh, forming uh, this double-stranded RNA, which got cleaved, attached to the risk complex, and the risk complex was able to attach to any mRNAs in your cell with a similar sequence to this little mRNA sequence, and that blocked gene expression. It, it inhibited gene translation. It inhibits gene translation, which effectively inhibits gene expression, right? Uh, for example, in your heart right now, 
your heart right now expresses micro RNA genes that don't actually code for any protein. They just code for these little mRNA that are going to form these hairpins, get diced up and regulate genes. Your heart's function relies on the expression of some of these micro RNAs that uh, regulate the expression or translation specifically of different proteins inside of your heart. Isn't that interesting? So your own body produces micro RNAs that help with your development and help with your function of your organs right now. Isn't that fascinating? It's a whole new field of research. It's, it's relatively new stuff. So that's how gene expression can be can be blocked, right? Stopped at the translational level using microRNA. Same thing with small interfering RNAs. This is when you have double strand DNA. It gets cleaved by dicer, uh, associated with the risk complex. And again, any mRNA transcripts in the cell with a similar sequence to that short piece of RNA attached to the risk complex will become cleaved, right? So now you've cleaved it at the three prime end You've cleaved the mRNA, and that leads to rapid degradation of the mRNA. Remember, RNA is very uh, fragile, and if you cleave it, and it doesn't have this protective poly A tail, the poly A tail that loops back and forms kind of a loop with the cap complex of, of the five prime N methylguanine cap of of mRNAs. Without all that intact, mRNA degrades rapidly, right? So if you're going to cleave the five, uh, the three prime UTR. Of, of mRNA, you're going to lead to rapid degradation of that mRNA, and you're going to prevent translation of this mRNA. Here's another interesting thing about siRNAs. Instead of siRNAs working in this fashion here in, in, in example one, where it degrades uh, the, the mRNA, it cleaves the mRNA, siRNAs can actually also feed back and bind uh, to to the DNA itself. It can bind to DNA itself, marking the DNA for methylation by a methylating enzyme, a methyltransferase, a meth methylating enzyme. The methylating enzyme will methylate the DNA wherever this siRNA bound, and that will cause the DNA to become... Uh, sequestered, right? Remember that if you methylate histone tails, that causes sequestration of the, of the um, uh, uh, promoters and turning off of the genes. Same thing when you methylate DNA, you prevent transcription of the gene by methylating the DNA. Methyl methylated DNA prevents transcription of the gene. Methylated histone tails prevents transcription of genes. And here's the stats box, you know, the epic stats box for the for the next model organism, this time the plant. What do we have here? We have Arab Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, this is a great plant to study, especially if you're going to do RNAi studies. There's a lot of RNAi that happens, RNA interference that happens in plants that, uh, that you could study. The small size plant, short generation time, you know, these are common themes between the different uh, model organisms that we've talked about. Each plant can produce tons of seeds, so that's good. Lots of progeny, able to grow in the lab, small genome, so not too, not too complicated of a genome. Many p variations available, self-fertilizes or cross-fertilizes. That's always good, if, especially if you're doing genomic studies uh, or heredity studies. So what, do you, what are they good for? plant genome organization, gene regulation, uh, definitely with RNAi stuff, genetics of plant development, genetics of flowering, etc. So it's a great model organism to study. Now, um, continuing on with epigenetics uh, effects, what, uh, I don't know if I mentioned uh, what epigenetics is. I may have touched on it in a previous chapter, but remember, these are changes. These are changes that are done in order to regulate gene expression without actually changing the, the sequence of the genes. Does that make sense? So you're not mutating a gene or changing a gene or removing a gene, but you're, you can regulate its expression by you know methylating the DNA, 
by by methylating uh, the the histone tails or acetylating the histone tails or modifying the histone tails, you can have effects on gene and phenotype gene uh, gene expression and the subsequent phenotype by turning off a gene or turning on a gene without actually harming the gene, right? Um, and this is what the study of epigenetics is. Epigenetics, right? Uh, a lot of times this has to do with changes in the chromatin structure, right? So you're sequestering the promoters, but you can also change the DNA methylation uh, on the on the DNA. You can change the uh, you know post translationally modify the histone tails. Uh, you can even you can even have the remember those SI RNA that that led to modification of the uh, you know methylation of the gene as well. So again, DNA methylation, this is when you're methylating the DNA itself. You're adding a methyl group to the nucleotide bases. Usually, you're methylating a cytosine to produce 5-methyl cytosine. So you see here, you have 5-methyl cytosine. So this would be DNA that's methylated. Okay, Before replication, DNA is fully methyl methylated at CPG, dinucleotides. Right, CPG dinucleotides. By the way, this is showing you how epigenetics works. Um, how can how can a gene that's off continue to be off after the the cell has divided? So let's say I'm copying this DNA that's methylated. I end up with you know uh, two different double strand DNA. Each one's you know, partly methylated on one, you know, on one strand and not methylated on the daughter strand. But then a methyl transferase enzyme comes in and recognizes the methyl groups and promptly methylates the daughter strand. Does that make sense? So you can propagate uh, DNA methylation utilizing these methyl transferase enzymes, these, these enzymes that come in after the fact and methylate the DNA. This way, what your cells have marked as a gene that needs to be switched off is continuously switched off, is continually switched off. Does that make sense? Um, before I move on, fun fact real quick, fun fact. You want to know the difference uh, between a stem cell and a differentiated cell, like a, like a skin cell? You know, what's the difference? A stem cell is a cell that is multipotent. A stem cell is a cell that could become multiple different types of cells, especially a pluripotent or a totipotent stem cell. These are the earliest cells in development that can become anything, right? Um, those cells have minimal methylation. You see the methylation of the DNA and methylation of the chromatin tails, right? The histone tails. So stem cells, early stem cells, have very few genes that are methylated or off. Most of the genes are on. Does that make sense? But as you develop, as this cell becomes a skin cell, and this cell becomes a, a stomach cell, and that one becomes a heart cell, more and more of your genes, as they differentiate into skin cells or heart cells or whatever, they become methylated over time, and that methylation persists with these methyl transferases. They, the histone tails become modified as well to sequester DNA. Genes are shut off. So the more differentiated a cell is in your body, the more genes have been shut off over time, right? So one of the challenges of, say, taking a skin cell and then cloning you is you have to wipe the memory of that skin cell of any methylation that happened. You know, and re it's called the reprogramming the cell. Isn't that fascinating? So just so you know, you know, why can't you just clone me from a skin cell? Well, it's not that easy. Uh, that skin cell has a lot of genes that are off, you know, and we need to wipe that memory clean. You know, we need to reprogram that cell. Isn't that interesting stuff? And that's what they do, actually, when they clone you from a skin cell. They have to deal with the methylation issue. They have to deal with this epigenetics issues, these genes that have been turned off over time by your own body, right? Fascinating things to think about, isn't it? Uh, so let's keep going. So again, you can modify the histones. That's a big part of epigenetic effects. Um, and there's 
more than 100 different post-translational modifications of histone proteins. So just to name a few, you could phosphorylate the histone proteins, methylate, we talked about that, acetylate, ubiqu uh, ubiquitinate. Um, you could do many different types of modifications to the histone proteins, and each one's going to have a different effect on the chromatin structure and ultimately on gene expression. So with that, I hope you learned a lot. Really interesting chapter, isn't it? Fascinating stuff. We're really getting into the nitty-gritty of molecular biology and how, you know, the genes work that make up your traits, right, and how they're turned on and off and regulated and such. Really fun chapter for me. I hope it was for you, too. Let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions, uh, and I'll catch you guys, as always, next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. A doctor D, doctor D, doctor D. Doctor D, doctor D, doctor D.